All right. Well, we are back in Mark, uh, looking at the next few verses, Mark chapter 1. Uh, we're, this is Jesus uh, in the beginning of his ministry. Uh, he's going to be baptized, go out into the wilderness. We'll look at a few things there and see a few connections with Old Testament verses. Mark is uh, going to be moving very quickly. In fact, as we begin, uh, chapter, chapter 1, verse 9, I'll just read in the NIV. It says, at that time, or the word that is in, uh, in uh, the, uh, the Greek, after that, it's going to be, ta- it's gonna be, word is immediately. He's going to use the word immediately. Uh, I think it's, well, let's see. I've got it on the next page. He's going to use the word immediately in verse, chapter 1, verse 10. Immediately he saw heaven being torn open. And that word immediately used by Mark is used 42 times throughout Mark. 25 times uh, at the beginning of a sentence and it, it means as I got written down there and it's, it sounds correctly it means immediately it means just then it can mean suddenly but he's going to be using it intentionally if you think 42 times you just immediately it moves you from one scene to the next scene quickly through the book of Mark so it, it's like you don't have any commercials you don't have any breaks there's no point to stop reading it just moves you through the story from him, him being baptized going to Galilee going to Mount Accessory of uh, Philippi and then down to the crucifixion. It moves you quickly through the story. And so as we read this, you're going to continue to hear the word immediately throughout the book of Mark. And here's one of the first times we're going to see it. Chapter 1, verse 9. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. As Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the desert, and he was in the desert forty days being tempted by Satan. He was with wild animals, and angels attended him. Then we're going to go into verse 14. After John was put in prison, we'll pick this up in more detail next week, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. Uh, The time has come, he says. Uh, The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. And Jesus was walking beside him, going to meet the the first disciples. We'll read into those verses here a little bit later tonight and then go into more detail. Uh, On your notes, on page 1, in those days Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John. Uh, in the Jordan. We spent some time last week talking about where John was at by the Jordan out in the wilderness. A couple things about Nazareth. It's a famous city today. In fact, we've driven through it a couple of times. Uh, It's just a village. There's a place you can go see. We'll we'll come up to it later on in the book uh, where where it drops straight down into the valley of Megiddo. There's a steep cliff where they they took Jesus to a high place of the city we're going to push him over the cliff because he was preaching. And we can see that. You can stand right there and see how drastic of a drop it is. You can look oversee, looking from the north, looking kind of north, uh, looking from the north, looking south, southwest. You can look oversee the whole Kidron Valley. Jesus could have gone out there as a child and just stood on that, that, that cliff and, and looked over and saw the trade routes. We talk about the trade routes running down. What I'm talking about here, here's Galilee, Jordan River. And then the Dead Sea is down here. John was baptizing in this area. Nazareth is right about here. Uh, this is the, uh, the uh, Valley of Megiddo. The trade route ran over here, the King's Highway. Here was the Mediterranean Sea. The coastal plain uh, led a route down here. And these would, and we've talked about this extensively at different times going through the Old Testament. Uh, the trade route would run right through the Megiddo Valley and connect here and connect here so you could come from the east cut across here go north south into egypt and so there'd be constant caravans going back and forth through here the trade routes nazareth is right here here's that cliff i was talking about where it drops down into the kidron valley and jesus as a child could have stood here and watched all this activity and and observed all that as as you can even today uh but what is interesting about nazareth we we know where it's at uh we uh you know i've been there but it's not mentioned anywhere in the Old Testament. Nazareth is not mentioned in the Old Testament, nor does Josephus mention it, or, nor does the Talmud, the Jewish explanation of the Scripture. So Nazareth really, a, up to this point, was just an, a no place. It was no prophecies, nothing. It was just a, a city there. And it was occupied by a lot of Roman soldiers at this time. 
Uh, and that's why, and we're not going to talk about it tonight, but I'll mention it, in John 1, 46, when uh, Jesus is introduced to Nathaniel, or they say we found the Messiah uh, from, from Nazareth, he goes, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Meaning there's, there's nothing there. I mean, it's like, pick out your small town in Iowa. You know, the, the governor is from, well, okay, we could go with Branstead. Uh, Branstead is from Leland which is between Thompson, which is a small town, and Forest City, because I grew up in Fort Thompson, went swimming in Forest City, and got, went to movies, went on dates. But we had to drive through this little town, going from a little town Thompson through this little village called Leland, and went into Forest City. Uh, and Governor, that'd be an example. Leland, what can come out of Le uh, Leland? Well, Governor Branstead, you know. As Don Call says, Governor for Life, but... Uh, if you remember Don Call. But nonetheless, that's the same thing here with, with Nazareth. It, 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 we know of it today. It's the city where Jesus grew up. But at that time, he, Jesus came out of an obscure uh, place. Uh, and on this map, you can see I've got three maps here to look at. Number one is just all the maps or the locations that will kind of come across in the Gospel of Mark. And you can go all the way to Caesarea Philippi by Mount Hermon. We've talked about that. Uh, we're going to head up into Capernaum here in next week uh, on the, the northwest coast of the Sea of Galilee. Uh, then uh, Tiberias is on the coast there of the Sea of Galilee. Sometimes the Sea of Galilee is called the Sea of Tiberias. And then Nazareth is right about, you can see where it's marked there, and the very small city of Nain, which is where the, the widow from Nain comes. Uh, there you can see Mount Tabor there in the Megiddo Valley. Uh, then in the middle there's Samaria. And then in the south of Samaria, you've got Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim, where Sychar and Sechem were at. Jesus will pass through that area. Um, and on down into Judea, uh, Jericho, Jerusalem, Bethany are all important cities, obviously Bethlehem, but doesn't come up in the story of Mark. The map next to it is just, I just, since it was, I was grabbing maps off my, out of my notes, I saw this one, I thought, well, this would fit. But that's the territories of the land of Israel during the Gospels. You can see that area called Galilee. I've got it up there at the very top with an arrow or a line drawing down. It was ruled by Herod Antipas at this time. Um, and that's the land of Galilee. So when we talk about Galilee, that is the province of Galilee. Yeah, next to it, over to the top right, is Euthria, which was ruled by Philip after Herod. That would be someone else related to uh, Herod the Great. Uh, and then below that, you've heard about it several times, the Decapolis, or Deca, the ten cities, Polis referring to cities, Deca, the ten cities, and that was a lot of Gentile territory there. Uh, that's ruled by the Roman proconsul in Syria after Herod the Great ruled. So it, after Herod died in around 4 BC, this was all divided up and given to different people to rule. So you've got Galilee, Euthria, Decapolis, there's your land of Samaria broken down, and then Judea in the, uh, the south by Jerusalem, ruled by a Roman procurator. That would be someone that was appointed by the Romans, like a governor. And, of course, it's going to be Festus and Felix in the book of Acts. But before that, it was Pilate. Idumea, going down to the south, that's basically the Edomites, or Edom, that was then converted to Judaism by force by the Maccabees, by the Hasmoneans, and then was called Idumea. Herod comes up from Edomia or Edomites he was an Edomite and then the land of Perea uh, the little land is kind of like part of Jordan today uh, Jesus is going to spend some time going over to Perea his last month of ministry before he comes back into Jerusalem for the final time anyway that's kind of the lands that you got Galilee, Euthria, Decapolis, Samaria, Judea, Edomia and Perea are all you know when we call, talk about Israel that's the provinces that were broken up at that time the next map shows you uh this is from the framework book all three of these are from the framework book but this is where i combined all the gospels together just going through a sequence and you've got you can see nazareth right there jesus is going to come down to john around bethany point two that's where he's going to be baptized in our story tonight. Then he's going to go into the Judean wilderness, and I've got him drawing, going back across the Jordan into, towards Jerusalem, towards Jericho, 
in that area. Again, that's the Judean wilderness, but it can be a lot larger than that area. I just got it drawn, kind of given an idea. You can see Qumran is in that area. We, we took, looked at some pictures last week taken from Qumran looking at the Dead Sea and looking up at where John was baptizing by the Dead Sea. But in the book of John, which we don't want to get into, otherwise you're going to start going through a chronology of all the, the Gospels, but Jesus is, is baptized in the book of John, same place, same time. John sees the Spirit come down on him, and that would be there at Bethany. Then he goes into the wilderness, and then he comes back out of the wilderness after 40 days and returns to John, and that's where John identifies and introduces Jesus to some of his disciples, some of John's disciples. Uh, and John the Apostle was with John the Baptist, and he says, when he saw, see, saw Jesus coming back, he says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And that's where some of John's disciples broke off and began to follow him because John had been talking about this man coming, this Messiah. You know, he, he had his idea of what it was going to be. Well, when he baptized him, we we're going to see tonight, when Jesus sees heaven open, John apparently sees the Spirit come down on him, and he knows this is the Messiah. Well, then Jesus is taken into the wilderness by, by the Spirit. And it's like, well, J John just keeps doing his ministry, apparently, for the next 40 days. Jesus returns from the wilderness back to where he was baptized. That's where John sees him again and says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes with It's like, how did he know? Well, I saw him like 40 days ago, 41 days ago, and then he disappeared. I saw the Spirit come down on him. I was about to start a message, and he comes up out of the water and goes immediately into the wilderness. Hey, hey, and he's gone. And so when he comes back, that's where John gives you some very good details about that first week coming back out of the wilderness where he introduces, John introduces John the Apostle to Jesus. Peter and Andrew find Nathaniel's introduced. Well, then Jesus leaves Bethany and goes up to Cana of Galilee because there's a family wedding. Again, you've got to consider, and again, we don't want to get too far off subject, but that that was a family wedding. Because look how close it is to Nazareth. And, there, and he must have known there was a wedding taking place. And Jesus comes up. Now when he returns, he's returning with this group of new followers. And he goes to the wedding and they run out of wine. And that's where he does his first miracle. And these disciples that were introduced to Jesus uh, by John the Baptist, and they follow him up here, they all of a sudden see, they're the, really the only ones besides Mary that know there was no wine. I saw him put water in those jars, or they put water. And now they're, it's like he demonstrated his glory to him for the first time. So they're kind of seeing this take place. So that's all taking place in rapid fashion with that 40 days in, the, in between. Uh, and that's detailed in the book of John. But nonetheless, that's the travel there. And John gives us a, an interesting perspective that it's not here. But nonetheless, uh, chapter 1, verse 10, and then it says, and when he came down. So John, Jesus comes down to John the Baptist there at, in the wilderness in Bethany on the other side of the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, there's the word immediately in the English Standard Version, very clear. The NIV kind of passes over it. He saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. Now John is also going to say he saw the Spirit descending on him like a dove. That, that was he, his clue because the, the one who sent John to preach is the one you see the Spirit descend like a dove. That's the Messiah. That's the one we're waiting for. Well, Jesus sees it when heaven's open. John at least sees the dove. Now, a question you can ask and think about, and, you know, uh, did everybody else see heaven open? Did everyone else hear the voice? Did everyone else see the dove? Or did Jesus, it says, Jesus saw heaven open and the Spirit descending. John, it says in, uh, in the book of John, that John the Baptist saw the Spirit descending like a dove. So these two are seeing these things. For It's possible everyone else is just like, there's just another guy getting dunked in the water, and the and the process just begins and jesus goes off into the wilderness uh but i already mentioned point one there immediately uh the word tearing torn ripping open is the word atezo uh if that's the right right way of saying it it is really a, a description almost of a theophany because it heaven is ripping open and we talk about in the old testament about god the heavens like isaiah says oh that you'd rend the heavens and come down well right here he is rending, tearing the heavens, and the Spirit is coming down. It's like a manifestation of God in the, in the world. Uh, and there's three things take place here. 
Uh, I'll, I'll get into those verses in a minute. But he says, you are my son. And he describes, now I want to point this out because this is part of the style of the book. You're going to have uh, heaven torn and a voice from heaven says, you are my son. Now, uh, there's, there's three things, three verses that are going to be included in that. We'll look at that next. But this is the beginning of the identification of Jesus. Heaven is torn. You are my son. This is uh, a commentator would call this a bookends uh, of the book because this is the beginning of the introduction to Jesus. But at the end, as he dies on the cross in chapter 15, verses 38 through 39, two things happen in those verses. The curtain, C-U-R-T-A-I-N, is torn in the temple and at that same time, Jesus gives up his breath. He gives up his breath, gives up the spirit. The curtain is torn. And someone says, surely this is the Son of God, the centurion. So right there, you can see, I'm going to just flip over to chapter 15, verse 38, and read it to you here in the NIV. Um, chapter 15, verse 38. Um, I'll just begin in verse 37. And you almost have three things. You've got the, the Spirit coming, heaven being torn, and God speaking, you are my son. In reverse order in chapter 15, he gives up the Spirit, the curtain is torn, and the centurion says. So it's, it's really, it's a perfect book. Now you say, if that's intentional, I mean, you say, well, it's just coincidental. It could be coincidental. But if Mark is writing this, Jesus received the Spirit. Heaven comes down, opens. The Spirit comes down, comes on Jesus. The voice from heaven says, you are my son. In chapter 15, with a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus heard the cry and saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the Son of God. And so it's, got, it's a perfect bookend uh, of the beginning Three things happen. The Spirit comes, heaven's torn, and God says, this is my son. At the end, Jesus gives up his breath. The curtain in the temple is torn from top to bottom, and the centurion identifies him as the son of God. And that's, you've got to imagine that's intentional on Mark's part of, of, of identifying those things. And that's just interesting to see that there. Um, now, a vo and a voice, verse chapter 1, verse 11, and a voice came from heaven, and uh, there's three things here. Uh, you are my son. And I, I want to spend just a moment looking at this. You are my son. My beloved. I'll say the word beloved because that's in there. You are my beloved son. Uh, with you I am well pleased. Okay. Now, with that... You've got these verses that we're going to just take a look at quickly. And uh, Psalm 2, and this is particularly verse 7. Uh, this, if you want to make a connection, and we went through Genesis when we went through the book of Hebrews chapter 11, talked about Abraham. God tells Abraham, take your son, the one you love is translated, or uh, it's a take your, your beloved son. That is the word used by god when he speaks to abraham take your beloved son and that's genesis 22 and then this is out of isaiah 42 uh we'll look at verse one there and there's some, this is right in that section chapter 40 41 42 of isaiah where there, isaiah is talking about the servant of god the suffering servant leading him into suffering and again up until you know this time up until the writing of the new testament you could say uh who was that suffering servant even you talk to jews today well the suffering servant was isaiah isaiah was suffering for god's sake so he's describing himself and his own ministry some would say and and it could be some would say israel is the suffering servant they're called and they've got to go through all this suffering because they're the ones representing god in earth so they see israel as being the suffering servant they'll claim that today but as we look at it as Christians, as the New Testament looks back at it, as you look at this kind of a statement, that servant was 
Jesus. It, it could have been Isaiah, but it's really fulfilled in Jesus. Sure, Israel is God's servant, but it's really talking here about Jesus. And so right here in, in the middle of those suffering servant verses, Isaiah 42 verse 1, is this right here. So you've got three verses, Psalm 2, Genesis 22, and Isaiah 42, and we're going to look at those, especially Psalm 2 and Isaiah 42. But within these, this servant, from the very beginning, this servant, it, you know, you, you're going to have your ideal of the Messiah is here. He's going to come in great authority. It's like, oh, great things are going to happen. It's like, no, look at the text. This person is going to suffer. This person is here to suffer before the crown, before he becomes the king. And so Mark, again, if he's writing uh, it, it, you know, 64 A.D., he's writing in Rome to those that are suffering, he's making it very clear they understand this whole Christian business is about entering the kingdom through suffering, which is, uh, Paul says the same thing as he went back to the churches in Acts, says, we w must enter the kingdom uh, through sufferings. You, you, before you enter the kingdom, you must suffer. It, it's, it's part of the plan. You don't just become a Christian and go to glory, or you don't just become a Christian and live your best life now. You become a Christian in this age, and it is an age of suffering, just like Jesus, the Son of God, came to fulfill his ministry. He's going to suffer to do the work, and that's what the book of Mark is going to present. Jesus is presented throughout the book of Mark as the servant. So let's go to uh, First Psalm 2, and you know these verses, um, but it's worth now looking at them, Psalm 2, uh, and see uh, uh, how these are strung together and what might be in Mark's mind, or at least in God's mind, as he says, God is one who says, you are my, my son, or you are my beloved son, let me read it here again, uh, and a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. Again, it's, it's a kind of a short statement, and I may feel like we're overdoing this. Uh, but Psalm 2, 7, this is where these verses come from. Uh, chapter 2 of Psalm, verse 1, as you know, this is uh, David writing, but he's talking uh, about Yahweh, the Lord, and he's talking about the anointed one. So you've got God the Father, you've got God the Son, and he's talking about the, 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 the Messiah who's going to be ruling the nations. And David is warning the nations of the world of time, understand, you are not going to have the world as your own. This world is going to be given to the Messiah, the anointed one. So all your time on earth is preparation for the ultimate king. So while you're here filling in time, my advice is make sure you honor the ultimate king who's coming and, 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 and don't waste your time. And so it begins. Why do the nations conspire? And right away you can see the nations are conspiring. There, there's opposition. Jesus in chapter 2, uh, as we go into next week and the, and the week after, he's going to demonstrate his authority. Mark's going to make sure you see he's going to have authority uh, over uh, demons he's going to have authority over sickness he's going to have authority to call disciples he's going to have authority to do these things to proclaim the king he's going to you're going to talk like john the baptist you know you have a message he's going to say the kingdom of god is here it it's here i'm announcing the kingdom is here so he's like got authority to announce the kingdom to choose disciples to heal diseases to cast out demons to do all these things and the very thing you see right alongside of that is opposition People are listening, but those with power, particularly the religious leaders, are like, uh, you're blaspheming. You are uh, a demon yourself. They're, then they, by the time they get to, into chapter 3, uh, we got to kill him. And so he declares his assort. He not just declares it, he demonstrates it, and they oppose it, which is exactly what you see right here in Psalm 2. It begins, why do the nations conspire and the people plot in vain? You can come against Jesus, you can plot his death, you can try to overthrow him, you can say it's blasphemy, you can say it's Beelzebub, but you can't. You can't stop this. The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. When you're coming against Jesus, you're coming against the one who says, you are my son. And they say, let us break their chains 
and throw off their fetters. That's the world saying we're going to throw off the chains and the shackles that God and his Messiah have put on us. Now, again, there can't be a more or clear message of our culture today of saying we are throwing off all the restraints, we're throwing off any sense of reality, and we are establishing our own practice here. They're, going, they're, they're just they're deconstructing, like I've said multiple times, they're deconstructing reality, which is exactly what the, they do right here. The nations conspire. Now, you may think, again, and you, you can think about this as you want to, but it's like it's the sin nature of mankind. Indeed, it's the sin nature of mankind. Indeed, it's individuals in their own lives. But right here, you're talking about the nations, the people plotting, the kings of the earth, the rulers. We're talking the elite. The elite rulers of the earth are plotting to overthrow God's reality. So again, you've got peoples. It talks about peoples here. You've got individuals. But this goes all the way up the ladder to the leaders of the countries. They know exactly what they're doing. They say, let us throw off the chains that have been established for us and make this our own. And I've got to throw that in there that I think that's what's, what we're looking at in our culture today. What is going on? There are people in leadership that are trying to th- off, throw off the chains of Yahweh and his anointed one. Uh, even today and it's, it's not like unique it's it's a historical practice it's been going on for centuries it's just like coming up and becoming obvious in our generation now what happens next where it falls to like we've talked about before does it just continue to cycle on through history and we reset and do it again or is this the final cycle is this it we're going into the end times we won't know until you know more things develop nonetheless let us throw off their fetters the one enthroned in heaven laughs. I mean, that's impossible. Uh, the Lord scoffs at them. Then he rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath. So you see three phases. He laughs and scoffs. He, then he rebukes them, saying, you're wrong. And then he terrifies them, meaning he doesn't feel threatened. He gives them instruction And then when they don't respond, he terrifies them in his anger or his judgment. And he says, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy hill. I've already taken care of this. Part of reality is the Messiah. Don't conspire against us. Bow your knee. You can't stop us. I'm warning you. Okay, you're not listening. Now they're terrified. And he says, I have us. There he is. I brought the Messiah. I will proclaim the decree of the Lord. He said to me, no, I will proclaim, now that's David writing, or that could be the Messiah now saying, I will proclaim his decree. Or like Jesus is going to do, I will proclaim the kingdom. The kingdom is here. I will proclaim his decree. He said to me, you are my son. And that's exactly, you are my son. That's what he's saying right there. So coming out of heaven is like, in a sense, a a fulfillment of Psalm 2. It was written prophetically, but here he says, he identifies, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask of me, and again, all these things are not said at the baptism or are not recorded, but if, if, if this, you are my son, comes from this set of scripture, God's intention of saying, you are my son, which would the, 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 the readers of the Old Testament understand, you are my son, follows or is followed by, ask of me and I'll make the nations your inheritance. Uh, the ends of the earth, your possession. You will rule them with an iron scepter. You'll dash them to pieces like pottery. So in my mind, I, I, I don't want to say that's what God is saying. But where this verse comes, or this line comes from, it comes from where God is introducing his son and saying, just ask of me and I will give you the nations. You are going to rule these nations with an iron scepter. You'll dash them to pieces. If they oppose you, you'll dash them to pieces like pottery. This is the one who's going to do it. Now, that's where he's headed. But before he gets there, he's going to have to go through the suffering he's going to have to do the work of the cross he's going to have to be the servant of isaiah but that's that's where it begins 
And then, of course, we said this, the word beloved, you are my beloved son, which is very similar to what he says to, or identical to what he says to Abraham. Take your beloved son, and he's going to take him to, to the place I showed you, and he's going to be prepared as a sacrifice. So when he says, this is now Abraham, take your beloved son, and take him to Mount Moriah and offer him, and then God it says, I'll prepare, you know, he tells, God will pro- provide the, the lamb or the ram, two things are provide the, the lamb, and then he finds a ram. Well, now he's introducing, this is my son, my beloved son, just like Abram had a beloved son that had to be offered as a sacrifice and they didn't follow through with it. This is my beloved son who's going to rule the nations, but he's my beloved son, which kind of leads into he's going to be the sacrifice. And then with you, I am well pleased. Now we go to Isaiah right in the middle of the suffering servant passages, chapter 42, verse 1. We could go back to chapter 40. And I, I just I just point out there you can start well oh yeah chapter forty it, it might be maybe makes sense chapter forty verse one of Isaiah comfort comfort my people says your God speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed that her sin has been paid for now how how has her sin been paid for maybe they're talking context there uh, by, by going into captivity and now it's time for them to be brought back and restored. Uh, but just notice her sins been paid for that she has received from the lord's hand double for her sins verse three a voice of one calling in the desert prepare the way for the lord make straight in the wilderness a highway for our god well that's john the baptist a voice, that's exactly john the baptist all the uh, the writers refer to that and every valley shall be raised up and every mountain shall be brought low and that's introducing uh, verse six a voice says cry out and I said, what shall I cry? Then all men are like grass. That's chapter 40, 41. Now we go to chapter 42. Um, chapter 42, verse 1 of Isaiah. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out. And again, they're going to use that verse later on. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not stuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till the, he establishes justice on the earth. In his law, the islands will put their hope, which is very in his law, the islands. And that's talking about the far distant lands of the Gentiles. The Gentiles, the nations, are putting their hope in this servant. So right there you've got, here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. And that is right there, uh, with you I am well pleased. That's a different translation, but Isaiah 42, verse 1. So you can see all of those from the Messiah, the nations being promised. He's going to rule and reign. He's a type of, or I, Abraham and Isaac were a type of him being the sacrifice. And in the middle of the suffering servant, God says, I am well pleased and I'm going to uphold him and he will accomplish everything he's going to accomplish. And that's what God says from heaven when John the Baptist baptizes Jesus. I mean, it, it, again, we could take that and expand that for me, a larger teaching, look at all the aspects of it. But you can see if it's a big collection of verses that he's captured three different places, this is the one we've been talking about all this time and he's come to fulfill it so bottom of page two of the notes and a voice came from heaven you are my beloved son that's psalm 2 genesis 22 with you i'm well pleased that's identifying him i'm pleased with what you're doing uh the suffering servant is going to accomplish the lord's will Uh, and i've got those all written down right there uh point c there i've got the verse right now behold my servant whom i uphold my chosen in whom my soul delights I have put my spirit upon him, and that's exactly what happens here. Heaven is open, and the spirit is placed on Jesus. He will bring forth justice to the nations. First, he's going to do the suffering servant work, and eventually, and we're still waiting for that day where justice is brought to the nations. And again, that's what the Christian hope is, not just hope of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ, but Jesus Christ is going to come and bring justice to the earth. Um, 
I point in point two, I write there that Jesus sees heaven open. Uh, John the Baptist sees the Spirit descend and then asks the question, did anybody else see it or was it just this, these two? The Bible clearly says these two saw something taking place. Um, and they write point three, the total revelation of who Jesus is will eventually point to the need for his suffering as the servant, not ruling as a king. That's kind of the struggle uh, that, that the disciples are going to have throughout the book of Mark, throughout all the Gospels, is they're looking for the ruling king and Jesus has to do that first part of the suffering servant. And everybody's, the, the scriptures, Jesus, God the Father speaking is making it clear. He's going to the cross. He's not going to conquer Rome. And again, very, where God leads him into the wilderness to confront Satan means the battle is not with Rome. The battle is with Satan and the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. And that's verse chapter 1, verse 12. The Spirit, I mean, this happens. John baptized him heavens open the spirit comes down god speaks this is my son who's going to rule the nations uh, my beloved son the sacrifice with him i'm well pleased he's going to fulfill my will and once that takes place the spirit again the word immediately is used again the spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness again notice again the word immediately uh it means that's the very next thing we'll just keep right going to the next scene we're not going to stop and think about it going to the next scene drove him into the wilderness and that word drove uh i've got it uh it's ekbalo ek is the greek word out of below is the word to cast or throw so this means out or from uh, below means throw cast I've got other things written down right here. And it's a different word than used by Matthew and Luke. Uh, ek below means to throw, cast out, put out, banish, bring forth, or produce. So you can, you can bring forth fruit, you can cast out. In fact, when they cast out a demon, when Jesus cast out a demon, he drove the demon out. So what you have right here is the Spirit of God that came on Jesus is going to the translator right there drive him into the wilderness now we're not talking about him being possessed by the spirit in the sense that he uh he's a zombie state just taken out there but the spirit now is in control of the the messiah's ministry the spirit has come on him and now first things first we're going here you need to be if you're going to be thrown out there driven out there cast out there he's taken out to confront satan now, the same word is going to be used to cast out demons where Jesus is in control of the demons and throws them out. You can see the word ball below. B -A, well, here, that's, that's Greek. Beta, alpha, lambda, lambda, omicron. But you can see in the English it would be below, like that, or ball, you know, throw. As we get the word ball, ek, out of. So it means to throw out. Um, ek, below, throw, cast. Mark and Luke say the spirit led jesus now that's more that's more tolerable the spirit leads him but notice the difference right there there i would consider them in a sense synonyms or at least looking at the same event from two different perspectives is the spirit is leading jesus out in matthew and luke which that's more acceptable we would say but mark is saying he was driven out just like jesus drives out the demons the spirit takes jesus and drives him out or matthew and luke say lead him out into the wilderness and that is part of the suffering he's got to now confront the enemy notice again we said last week he didn't take him and drive him into rome or into the you know the the the, the you know courts of a pilot or something he takes him out to face the real problem which is the powers of satan uh the spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness and again the wilderness is a theme that's where john's at that's where the israelites were at Anytime you see in the, the wilderness is usually a place where people have gone uh, for a variety of reasons, but that's where they meet the Lord, is in the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness, chapter 1, verse 13, he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan, and he was with wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. Several things, again, the wilderness, 40 days, which is probably a direct connection with Israel being in the wilderness for 40 years. They were in the wilderness being tested for 40 years before they crossed over. Jesus now has to go off into the wilderness for 40 days and be tested. Uh, Matthew and Luke talk about the three temptations that Jesus went through. Uh, the, the jumping, the uh, turning the stones to bread, the bowing down to Satan. 
Mark doesn't name any specific, but he talks about the 40-day period. So again, from here we get the perspective that he is, Jesus is spending 40 days in a place of temptation, in a place with Satan, where Satan is not just three different events, those are identified by Mark and Luke, but this whole period, just like Israel was in the wilderness for 40 years, Jesus is in that stress position for 40 days. And it goes on and says, along while he is out there, these things happen. Uh, Satan is there. He's being, uh, Satan, the word Satan, the Hebrew word, it means the accuser, uh, the advocate. He is coming, Satan is coming against Jesus. That, the word Satan means the very accuser, the advocate, not adv- the accuser, the, uh, let me read it off here so I say it right. Uh, adversary and accuser not advocate that's that'd be ridiculous uh and there's wild animals are there and we should think of not just like you know squirrels and bunny rabbits running around in the desert you know in the evenings but wild animals uh that are dangerous you know lions and there were lions especially by the jordan there's animals there that could you know attack a man that's out there by himself and it says the angels were serving him ministering to him the word is ministering if i spell that right ministering the word is like waiting on tables they're they're serving and waiting on him uh and again obviously he's not eating food because he's fasting those 40 days but these are the things that are taking place which leads us into uh psalm 91 i'm going to go to psalm 91 real quickly again psalm 91 because this is uh, interesting. Satan used this verse at this very time against Jesus when he says that Jesus will jump. If you jump, the angels will not let you, you know, hit your foot against the stone. They'll, they'll catch you. They'll let you land. They won't let you be harmed. And he quotes this very verse to him, Psalm 91. Um, Psalm 91, uh, uh, it's a great verse of promised protection that god has for his people for his anointed one especially when we talk about jesus uh chapter 91 verse 1 i won't read the whole thing i'll just get started into what we want to go to is chapter verses 11 and 12 he who dwells in the shelter of the most high that'd be a man who dwells in the shelter of god will rest in the shadow of the almighty the protection of the almighty i will say of the lord he is my refuge and my fortress my God in whom I trust. Surely he will save you from the fouler snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers, like you know, a bird protecting him, uh, and under the, his wings you will find refuge. He goes on and talks about this. Uh, verse 7, A thousand may fall to your, uh, your side, ten thousand at your right side, but it will not come near you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. This is when God is moving through the land, destroying the wicked. His will be kept safe. If you make the Most High your dwelling, even the Lord who is my refuge, then no harm will befall you. No disaster will come near your your tent. Here's the verse. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. Now, Satan quoted that verse to Jesus. He says, go ahead and jump, and I've got a verse for you to do because God says that when you come, the angels will not let you cut your foot against the stone. But it goes on, you will tread upon the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. So when you tie that together, Satan is in the wilderness. Jesus has been driven out there by the Spirit to confront Satan, to be tested by Satan, just like Israel was in the wilderness for 40 years and failed, 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 Jesus is out there with Satan for 40 days and passes. That, I mean, that's the difference. Jesus returns in the power of the Spirit, having passed the test. Uh, Adam and Eve failed the test when they met Satan and wild animals. The animals talked to Eve. She led Adam, and they failed. Israel's out in the wilderness with Satan, with the temptations. In the wilderness, they failed. Jesus has to pass the same test. He faces Satan for 40 days. There's wild animals, but the angels come, Mark says, and minister to him, which I think is coming right out of Psalm 91. 
or at least you got to consider it, that when, and Satan used these verses, he uses Psalm 91 to say, okay, since, you're, since you've got this, you're rocking and rolling out here, it looks like you can just do anything. You could jump off, I'd have a demonstration, jump off and show everybody who you are. He said, no, no, that would be tempting God. No, I'm not going to tempt, I'm going to do what I've called to do. I've not been called to demonstrate all these things for my own glory. And so the wild animals, when the angels are ministering to him, according to Psalm 91, he is going to trample on the cobra. He's going to destroy the lion. And then that would be the natural animals. I'll, I'll read this again. You will, verse 13, you'll tread upon the lion and the cobra. But then the next part of that verse, verse 13, you will trample the great lion and the serpent. The great lion and the serpent. First it's natural animals. Then it's thought the great would be possibly referring to the great ones, the, the, the spiritual forces. And angels are assisting him while he's out there to accomplish this, which is no different than any time you see the Lord moving in history. The Lord is doing the work, but the angels are there assisting him in his work. Uh, he's going to say this in John when someone is amazed. Uh, uh, who was, was it Nathaniel that was under the tree? Uh, and, and, and they said, we found the Messiah from Nazareth. And he says, well, what good game come out of Nazareth? And he comes back and meets Jesus and says, ah a true israelite whom there's nothing false he says i saw you while you were under the tree and he goes why what how did I, he's you know a master teacher he calls him god and so in that case right there jesus is being able to see these things but also confront both the animals and uh oh oh i know what i was gonna say angels he, here we start starting, where are they going with that he says, he says, you're amazed that I saw you under the tree. I said this. He says, you'll see greater things than these. You'll see angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man, which makes sense because whenever God does something in history, it's always the angels that are coming along with him and, and doing the work for him. And in here, they're out there ministering to him. So it ties it right into Psalm 91, ties it right into whenever the Lord intervenes in history. The angels are there assisting him. The wild animals aren't harming him. Satan's not harming him. He's going to overcome this. And that can all be taken out of that, uh, of what is being said. And then you turn the page on your notes. And uh, I'm going to read now through some other verses. We'll pick this up next week. But what's going to happen now when he comes out of there? Well, look in chapter, uh, uh, page 4, chapter 1, verse 14. Now, after John was arrested... See, now, now we, there's, a whole many, there's all kinds of details in the book of John about what's taking place when Jesus comes out of the wilderness. He meets with John again. John introduced him to more disciples. Uh, all that skipped. All that is skipped. Because what Mark is now focused on, when Jesus comes, and this is going to be the theme of next week, when Jesus comes out of the wilderness, the Messiah is here. And he is going to have authority. He's got the Spirit. He's been identified by God. He's faced Satan and defeated him. And now he goes up into Galilee where he's going to begin his ministry. And his ministry is going to be a ministry of authority. Uh, I'll just read through these things right here on top of page four. First, he's going to proclaim the gospel. And we'll talk about what that means, proclaim the kingdom. Uh, he's going to call disciples, uh, which is unique because usually a disciple, it was common in this day for rabbis or teachers to have students that would follow them, live with them, be around them as they could hand off their teaching. Uh, but usually the, dis the disciple would seek out the teacher and try to be qualified uh, to be selected by the teacher. And I'd like to fill out the paper. It's like going to college. Do the paperwork, take the test, I get in. Jesus doesn't have them come to him. He goes to them and calls the disciples. Now in the book of Mark, again, it, it, I don't want to say it's deceiving, because it's not deceiving in any way. Mark is picking out the things that is going to make drive home the point that Jesus has authority. If we include the other Gospels, especially John, we can see that John the Baptist introduces the first apostles to Jesus, kind of almost hands them off. They go get their brothers and their friends, and the, the 12 kind of grow out of that group. Jesus calls a few of them himself. But in Mark, it just, he just goes into Galilee, proclaims, proclaiming the kingdom is here, and then finds, you guys, follow me. It's like, it almost gives you that, you know, cultish feeling of this man just walking along the beach. It's like, you, follow me. And they just blindly walk off with him. Again, 
that's not what happened the the book of john makes it clear they've already met they've gone back to work they've been to the canaan of galilee they've been to the wedding with them they've seen the water turn to wine and now they've got they they haven't like you know started the their studies or started their their ministry there they've met jesus they went down to spend some time with john the baptist they got caught up in jesus wedding feast now they've gone back to work and jesus comes walking by and says okay it's time follow me and he calls them so there's been some groundwork mark's point is jesus has authority he just says these guys come follow me and they follow him um uh, I'll read it right here on this page. Oh, here, oh, at the top of the page. They, he proclaims the kingdom, calls disciples, casts out demons, heals the sick, and forgives sins. He's going to start going up right. First thing he does, goes to Galilee and starts demonstrating the authority that the Son of God has with the Spirit. And the response is, they say he's blaspheming. Uh, they, they associate, he's, he's associating with sinners. He's not doing what he should be doing. Uh, and he violates the Sabbath. So they've got all these accusation, accusations against him. Uh, I'll read uh, on bottom of page 4, uh, chapter 1, verse 14. Now, after John was arrested, very interesting, John's fulfilled his ministry, and what happens then? He's done. He's arrested. It's like even John, the great proclaimer of the, of, of the coming of the Lord, he's done it. He goes to jail. He, that's his end. Uh, again, think about this being written in rome during nero persecutions these people have chosen to follow christ and all of a sudden it's like what everything's falling apart we're, we're losing stuff we're being martyred we're being sent to the arena the coliseum it's like yeah and so did john and so did jesus so did the apostles it's like welcome to christianity this is what you can expect it's like nothing's wrong here now after john was arrested jesus came into galilee proclaiming the gospel of god and saying now again we'll talk about this more next week the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of god is at hand repent and believe the gospel so he's proclaiming the gospel of god the gospel of god is the good news the gospel uh, jesus has come this is uh, here i am I'm, the time is now changed remember what we talked about gospel meaning when the, when an emperor was born or they'd announced the gospel of the emperor it's like there was a day that we lived where we didn't have this emperor and now he has come and now there's a day history's going to be turned right here that's going to be that this emperor has been here, that we now live under this emperor. Remember the days before? But now we live in these days. The gospel of God, there was a day before Jesus came in the, and was baptized, and now the gospel of God is his Messiah is here. This is now a turning point in history. That's what the gospel means. It, it's good news because it used to be one way, now it's going to be another way. So again, you know, you, you don't want to bring in that modern meaning of gospel. Well, the gospel is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. Okay, you, you're really taking that and just, you know, putting, just co- condensing it down into one little sliver of what it means in Protestant Christianity. The gospel of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ is, is just copying the emperor. The, the, the emperor had come, and when he came, he changed the old ways and made them the new, the better ways of where you're living well, now, forget the emperor. This is the gospel of God, the gospel of Jesus. He has come. And Jesus goes up with authority in a Galilee and announcing the gospel. It used to be one way, and now I'm here. The kingdom of God has come. It's at hand. It's like, well, I don't understand. What, what, well, let me show you a few things. Now, this right here, again, we'll talk about this more next week, that the gospel of God is at hand. It's like, so this is where you can go, like, well, it, but it wasn't. He died and, and went back to heaven. But at the same time, the gospel is, the good news is Jesus. It's like, here's the, the king is here. So the kingdom is, can't be too far away because here is the king. I'm here. The king has the Messiah. Psalm 2, I've come to the earth. I'm a man. And it's, it's never going to be the same. Now, we're not going to do the full kingdom program now. But we are, it has come. We are, we're, we've begun the process, and I'm here. And so it's time for you to repent and come over and follow me. Uh, so that's his authority. He's proclaiming. He's up there saying, I'm here. It's, the page has been turned. Uh, then he's going to choose, a, his next one to be a choosing a, apostles, passing along the Sea of Galilee. Now notice how he just rushes into this. He went to Galilee. John's arrested. Jesus in Galilee says the gospel of God is here. It's at hand. Here I am. Then he's going along the coast of Galilee. He sees Simon and Andrew. 
he, he, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea. So he sees Peter and Peter's brother Andrew. They're casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. They're, they're back to work. Now, it doesn't say they've already met each other at John's, down by John's ministry. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I'll make you become fishers of men. And you, you know that from a lot, a lot of times. I remember singing the song when, when I was like seven years old. I will make you fishers of men, fishers of men. I love the hand signs. You fish, then you reel it in. That was, that was a seven-year-old Galen. But I still remember it. Uh, and, and then it says, and notice here, and immediately, there's your word, and immediately they left their nets and followed him. Which again, authority, they, they're fishing, and now they left their nets. I will point this out again next week. Anytime, if fishers of men, this is the first time it's used in any kind of a positive sense. It's been used throughout the Old Testament, fishing for men, casting nets for men. That's what uh, the, that the, the Assyrians did. Or Habakkuk's talking about, he's... he's bl- challenging god that these these babylonians they just cast the net and capture men like their fish well jesus now turns it around he uses the same imagery now we're going to start catching men he said we're not going to catch them for their destruction we're going to catch them for their good and immediately left their nets and followed him chapter 1 verse 19 and going a little further he saw james the son of zebedee and john his brother who were in their boat mending the nets and immediately he called them, again immediately, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. Now, again, right there, you, we'll bring this up several times, but right there, it may be two different groups because this is not Peter's home. This is in Capernaum. Peter's from Beth- Bethesda, which is, a, well, I'll show you some maps and some places where, so, but he's moved to Capernaum. And he started a fishing business there along with his brother Andrew, apparently, but that's not his hometown. He lives in Capernaum. That's where his mother-in-law is at. Maybe he moved into the same house where his wife was. I mean, we don't know. We know where Peter's house is at. And I'll show you that. And Jesus is going to be there here in a few chapters. Uh, but James and John were also fishermen, but they were of a family business because they're fishing with their father Zebedee. But when they leave, don't worry about it because the servants are still there. So we've got, a, we've got a business. I mean, we're not talking about slaves, but they work for, they've been hired by Zebedee along with his sons. So James and John are, we would say, they're more upper class, potentially, and Peter and Andrew are going to be more, you know, the working class. They're two different, and you can kind of see that, the friction throughout the Gospels uh, between the working class and the upper class. Even when you get to uh, Jerusalem, you're going to find out uh, that John has a house in Jerusalem because Mary is going to stay with John and John stays in Jerusalem. When Jesus is arrested and the high, he's in the high priest's quarters, John goes in and they recognize him. They let John in. But Peter, they won't let in because they knew John, which is upper class again. We're talking about the priesthood and the upper class where Peter, it's like, no, he looks like a fisherman from Galilee. John says, no, he's with us. And they let him come in only because john says he could come in so there's just there's throughout there and you see right there uh you can see the difference as they're being introduced here and remember this is according to all our sources mark is writing this but it's peter's account so a lot of these things that are being said are what peter remembered and the way peter would have told the story mark's not so much making the story up as much as he is recording of the things peter says and he's going to record the words and the phrases that peter would have used and the situations that peter would have remembered and immediately he called them uh james or james and john and they left their father zebedee in the boat with their hired servants and followed him and they went into capernaum now they were probably just outside capernaum on the shores and i can show you some pictures it's just you've got the synagogue and you can stand in the synagogue look just across the street and you can see peter's house and when you and while you're just look up and you can see the coast you see the sea of galilee in the background there so peter when he would get up in the morning and step out on his deck there's the sea of galilee i mean depending on how many buildings were there but it's just when it's all torn down it's just right there so they're in they went into capernaum and immediately on the sabbath he entered the synagogue and was teaching now i'm going to read through this and you're going to see miracles you're going to see demons and you're going to see the people respond, but I want you to notice that what they respond to is his authority 
and the authority manifest as teaching. He's he's teaching. The, he's explaining. He's he's uh, presenting. He's revealing a teaching that is like they're amazed. Well, just watch just watch the crowd and just li- listen for teaching. Uh, verse 21, and they went into Capernaum and immediately on the Sabbath, he in, notice again the word immediately. I mean, it's like they're fishing and all of a sudden, boom, they're in the Sabbath. It's like, well, I mean, were they fishing Sunday or Saturday morning on the Sabbath? It's like, well, that's how the story just, just keep rushing. So immediately doesn't always mean they, they were, went down by the nets. They're fishing right before Sabbath or right before synagogue services on the Sabbath, which of course they wouldn't be. Uh, and they got out of fishing. Immediately, we got to get to the synagogue. We were almost late. That's not what this means. It, he's just pushing the story. It's a writing technique of where he's pushing the story along because he's in the water. Immediately the Spirit comes. Immediately he's out of the water. Immediately he's in Galilee. Immediately he's in the synagogue. It's like, or John is going to slow it down, say. In fact, John is going to say on the second day and the third day and on the fifth day. It's like, well, what days are these? Well, they're days of when Jesus came out of the wilderness. The first day, John introduces us. The second day, we did this. The third day, we went to Galilee. And it's like he's giving you more of a sequence where Mark is rushing it. Not to rush, but to keep the story going, which you wish I would do and stop explaining it. And when, at verse 21, and they went into Capernaum and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. In other words, the, that difference there, the scribes would all be just merely wrote repeating the things that had been written down all the 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 laws and all the teaching and all the connections and it's almost like wrote if you heard it in this synagogue you'd hear it in this synagogue these when we get to this point we say these things and we point out these three principles and then we go here and like this and jesus it's like this is different this guy's like talking like he's like explain it's like off the cuff it's like he's explaining it's like it's like he's seen it like he's been there it's like you don't have any notes. You're, it's like he, he's teaching like he knows what he's talking about. He's not just gone to school and memorized the facts. He's talking to us about it. They were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority, not as the scribe. So he wasn't teaching like a scribe. He was teaching somehow differently. Now, what you got? What the scribes taught this way. So all you got to do is figure out how the scribes taught, and we got a pretty good idea because we got their writings. But Jesus wasn't like this. He was here. The best way to describe it is he had authority. He didn't have to memorize all these steps and facts, and these are the things we say at this point. It's like, yeah, whatever. Let me just tell you what we're talking about. And immediately, there, see, you know, there's immediate, and immediately there was in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. Okay? So now, in the, what's he doing in the synagogue? It's like, what in the synagogue of all places? Yeah, the synagogue. You've got scribes who are just not teaching with authority. You've got all religious leaders who are going to come against the Messiah when he shows up. Of course, there's an unclean spirit there. But this unclean spirit, apparently, it was it his first time? It's like, who's this strange homeless guy that came into our meeting today? It's like, no, that's, that's Bob. He comes every week. It's like, all of a sudden, when the teaching with authority, all of a sudden, the demon starts speaking. It's like, Bob, you've never done that before when I was teaching. Yeah, but you've never taught like you had authority. I'm shaken here. And so immediately there was in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out. He interrupts the teaching with authority. What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Notice the man doesn't say, what do you have to do with me? The man says, what do you have to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? Yeah, that, that was exactly his message. I'm here to destroy the people in the synagogue. Well, no, that's not his message. But what he's seeing right here, this man, this, this demon, or the demons, the unclean spirits in this man, sense that there is or knows that you have come to make war with us. Not Rome, not with the religious leaders. You've come to make war with us and destroy us. Okay, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. Now here we we got to introduce this, and i got to quit. Jesus, right here, there's something going on in this throughout this book. Jesus doesn't want people, and I've said it before, doesn't want to be exposed as the Messiah. 
And right here, the, this demon wants to blow the cover. You're the Holy One of God. You're the one we're waiting for. You're the one who's going to overthrow the Romans. You're the one who's going to take over the world. We know what you are. It's like, quiet. That's not, that's not the mission. I mean, I'm reading into this. But why would Jesus, he always wants to keep it on the down low that he's the Messiah. It's like, no. Because when they say Messiah, it's a buzzword. It's got political connotation. He's going to overthrow the Romans. We're going to start a war. We're going to take over the world. It's like, yeah, I'm the Messiah, but I'm not that Messiah. So when you say Messiah, it doesn't mean what you think it means. I'm the Messiah, yes, and I'm going to the cross. And even Peter argued with him because the disciples figure out he's the Messiah. They're just not supposed to tell everybody. But they know that he's going to take over the world and he's going to overthrow the Romans. Then he says, no, no, I'm going to go to the cross. Peter says, no, no, come here. That's, no, that's not right. Let me, let me, <laughs> you got to get your sights set higher. I mean, stay focused on the truth, on the word of God. You're here to... And, and he looked at him and says, get behind me, Satan. Because Satan wanted to rush this with, through Peter, just like he wants to rush it here through this demon. You're ready to take over the Roman Empire. It's like, no, I'm not. Be quiet and come out of him. Uh, and the unclean spirit convulsing him, the man, and crying out with a loud voice came out of him. And they were all amazed. Watch this. So that, so that they questioned among themselves saying, watch this. What is this? A new teaching with authority. You just think and saw a, an unclean spirit driven out of man. The man's flopping around the floor. The demon's gone. And what you say, you say, wow, I've never seen a demon cast out. I've never seen a demon speak through a person. This is amazing. I've never seen signs and wonders like this. What do they say? And they were all amazed so that they questioned among themselves saying, what is this? A new teaching with authority. This is, a, this I've never heard that kind of teaching, and this teaching has like this authority with it that it's not like the scribes. There's, oh, we've never seen this before. Again, it's interesting. They, 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 they noticed the teaching. His, his explanation of things was like different than a normal sermonette or a lecture or, a, you know, speaking. They were all amazed, so they questioned among themselves. A new teaching, he commands even unclean spirits, and they obey him. And at once, his fame spread everywhere throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. So right there, Mark, and we're just beginning, but Mark is going to now again move into healing and a variety of other things that he's going to have authority over, that this, this is indeed the Son of God. He's going to now prove with his authority. Other people don't do these kind of things. I'll pray, and we're done. Father, we thank you for the chance to look into your word. We ask that we, again, would honor Jesus Christ, that we would serve him today as we look forward to his coming kingdom. And, Father, we ask, again, that we may proclaim the gospel, the good news that Jesus Christ has come and has changed history forever, and that our hope is in him. Again, we ask that we would, again, live a life that is pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for your time.